Hello and welcome to episode three of New Wesleyan Podcasts. Uh, as I mentioned on our website, uh, if you've checked in there, uh, iTunes will not post our podcast until after we complete this third podcast. Uh, so uh, sometime in the next couple of days, it all will process through, through whatever it processes through at, at iTunes. And these podcasts will be available for download on iTunes. You can always get them from our website. You can listen to them from our, our website, as well as take in uh, all of our content, uh, videos, uh, everything we have to offer, many resources as well. Uh, on today's podcast, uh, I want to talk about, uh, you know, one, what we do talk about. Um, I, I don't have any prepared script. Uh, I don't do any notes for, for these podcasts. Uh, I, I literally ask God uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, to work through me and, and tell me what it is he would have me discuss on, on today's uh, podcast. And... Uh, he said schism. Uh, that's what he told me to, uh, to focus on today. And I just want to, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with that word, I want to read the, the definition to you. Schism is a split or division between strongly opposed uh, sections or parties caused by differences in opinion or belief. Uh, that is what's happening in the United Methodist Church right now. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today, uh, but before I get into to that part of the, the show today, I do want to remind everyone that uh, Moyoc Christian Fellowship is in transition right now uh, to our new name, which is New Wesleyan. Uh, that shift is, is done for several reasons. One, uh, it allows us to get back to our Wesleyan roots. Uh, it allows us to, to reach a wider audience. If you're, you're following the website, you know that uh, generally on Wednesdays we do a post where we recognize uh, the many visitors and guests we have uh, from around the nation and around the world. Uh, the people that are checking in and, and countries around the world, absolutely incredible. Um, but we felt the need uh, to kind of shift away from a local name to a, uh, a more recognized uh, kind of national, international name. Uh, Wesleyan is recognized around the world. Uh, there's a new Methodism uh, being formed right now uh, as part of the schism in the United Methodist Church. Uh, and so uh, we felt it necessary to uh, better identify ourselves, one, as Methodists, though we are no longer United Methodists, uh, we split from the United Methodist Church back in August of 2019 to form Moyoc Christian Fellowship. Uh, now, speaking of Moyoc Christian Fellowship, uh, it's still going to be around uh, while uh, New Wesleyan will take on uh, kind of a, a bigger presence in who we are and, and what we represent. Uh, Moyoc Christian Fellowship will still be part of our website and part of of who we are and what we do. Um, that will be uh, more of our, our local gathering uh, here in Northeast North Carolina. Uh, it will have its own page on our website uh, to kind of chronicle what we are doing locally. And uh, the website itself will uh, be more of an expression of what we are doing uh, locally around the nation and around the globe to try and make disciples of Jesus Christ. So uh, that's kind of the direction we're going in. Uh, but I've been reading online uh, many, many articles about uh, the schism in the United Methodist Church. And several of the articles that I, I've come across in the past couple of days uh, are, are kind of alarming <clears throat> in that the writers uh, seem to be operating under a, a false narrative that was put forth by uh, some groups in the progressive movement. Now, the progressives, of course, in the United Methodist Church are that group that want to change the Book of Discipline, which is 
the denomination's book of laws uh, to say that gay clergy are welcome to be ordained in the denomination and that same-sex marriages can be performed inside the church in the denomination. Uh, traditionalists, on the other hand, uh, oppose changing that language in the Book of Discipline, uh, believe that the scripture is the divine inspiration of God and therefore isn't subject to change. Now, the progressives, on the other hand, I'm gonna keep going back and forth between the two, uh, the progressives have put forth kind of a, a new idea that some scripture uh, doesn't apply anymore, doesn't apply to today. Uh, they're saying that uh, Leviticus, which talks about uh, man lying with man being an abomination, uh, they're saying that doesn't apply. That doesn't mean anything today. Uh, that it was written for a, a different group of people at a different time and no longer applies to this time, to the current time. Uh, and they say that about several uh, lines of scripture. There are about seven, I think, uh, lines of scripture in the Bible that, that address uh, homosexuality. And uh, clearly the progressives oppose all of them. And, and of course they oppose other, other lines in, or scriptures in the Bible as well. Uh, traditionalists, on the other hand, uh, and we at Moyop Christian, uh, now shifting to New Wesleyan, uh, are decidedly traditionalists. Um, so we believe, again, that uh, the scripture is the divine inspiration of God and is not subject to change. It's not subject to irrelevance. Uh, we can't pick and choose which verses in the Bible we like and don't like and only apply the ones that we like to our daily life. Uh, the Bible's been with us for a couple thousand years and it's worked very well up until now. Uh, progressives have uh, literally uh, taken the Bible and applied an a la carte uh, kind of philosophy to it. Uh, we'll pick and choose the scripture that we like and we'll apply that to our daily lives. But the scripture we don't like we're going to set aside. We're going to say that it was written for someone else in some other time and doesn't apply to today. Uh, that makes absolutely no sense if you think about it. Uh, to think that we can pick and choose scripture out of the Bible um, would mean that any scripture we could, we could literally pick to disobey because we don't like it. Now people have not liked uh, some of the scripture in the Bible uh, going all the way back to when it was written. Uh, so there's nothing new there that people don't like some scripture. But we can't set it aside simply because we don't like it. Uh, every circumstance you can think of uh, that man and woman face today can be found in the Bible somewhere. It's addressed. It's not by mistake uh, that God gave those words to the men who wrote those books because they apply so well today. Everything applies so well today. Um, so that's kind of the difference between traditionalists and progressives and why this schism or split of the denomination uh, is so important. It is absolutely time to move beyond all of this. Uh, the false narrative that I mentioned earlier, I want to get back to that. One I'm reading online uh, is a, a blatant attack on traditionalists as hating gays. And that's simply not true. Traditionalists do not hate gays. Uh, traditionalists follow the scripture. They follow Jesus' commandment uh, that we are to love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, we don't question that scripture because guess what? Traditionalists believe in all the scripture, all right? We're not picking and choosing. So we believe that and we apply that in our daily lives. The United Methodist Church, going back decades, changed the wording in the Book of Discipline to say that gays are welcome in the United Methodist Church. They can come, they can join, they can participate. The only thing they cannot do is get married in the church in a same-sex union and they cannot be ordained as clergy if they are a practicing homosexual. 
That's the only difference. All right. So traditionalists uh, are not haters. And that's the narrative that keeps getting pushed uh, by some on the progressive side of the aisle. And, and reading that in print is, is very disturbing that people are saying that because it simply is not true. Uh, I think we can draw a line and say that uh, just because traditionalists uh, believe in the scripture that, that tells us that uh, the gay sexual act, if you will, is an abomination. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't love gays at all. Uh, it just simply means that uh, we, we don't approve of that act. Uh, that's all it means. Um, so uh, I'd like to see a big push uh, by the traditionalist side of the house to, to, to help end that narrative that's being pushed. Now, the traditional side of the house is being led by the Wesleyan Covenant Association. Uh, they represent the traditionalists uh, in the denomination. Uh, the Wesleyan Covenant Association and their, their body has not decided or, or come to terms on a new name for the traditional denomination. Uh, but that'll be forthcoming and that will help give uh, more identity uh, to the traditional movement. Uh, the progressive movement, and, and I've written about this on uh, several people's websites uh, recently, or organizations' websites, um, as early as this morning, uh, tra traditionalists are, are getting an incredible deal. Traditionalists are going to be able to walk away from the United Methodist Church with 25 million in seed money spread out over four years to start and grow a new denomination. Now, traditionalists make up roughly half of the church, all right, half of the United Methodist denomination. Uh, progressives, on the other hand, are retaining the UMC name. Uh, the UMC brand has been damaged for decades, and more so in recent years over this issue. Uh, it's literally been drugged through the mud. I don't know why the progressives want to keep that name. It's going to be so incredibly hard to rebuild the brand. Uh, but that's what they want. Let them have it. Uh, Methodists or, or traditionalists on the other side, uh, as I said, are, are going to walk away and start clean. Uh, they've got no brand they need to rebuild. They've got a brand they need to launch. But well, that's going to be easily accomplished. Uh, progressives are also keeping all of the business entities of the United Methodist Church. Um, that's pretty much a losing proposition. Uh, several very learned individuals have written about this recently uh, in different forms. Uh, that It's going to be nearly, nearly impossible for the UMC after May 2020, to pull itself out of a hole that is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I give you an example. The Episcopal Fund pays bishops' salary. All right. Uh, right now, the Episcopal Fund uh, has announced or announced last year in 2019 they're going to run out of money by 2023. All right. That's under today's construct. That's under today's apportionments coming in from all directions. After May 2020, as things branch off, half of those apportionments are going to go away. All right? The United Methodist Church, after 2020, this, this new UMC that has all these business entities and has all these bishops to pay, uh, are going to have to do so with only half the amount of money they've got coming in right now. So the Episcopal Fund is going to dry up much sooner than predicted. There's no way around it. Now, you may wonder, well, what about the bishops on the traditional side? Well, traditionalists are leaning away from bishops, uh, leaning away from having them in the numbers we have them today. Uh, so there's going to be less on the traditional side. So that again leaves the progressives 
trying to figure out how to pay all these folks. Uh, clearly, they'll offer some incentive for people to, to retire early or uh, go back into full-time ministry in a, a local church. I'm sure there'll be all kinds of options for them. But bishops are extremely expensive. Uh, their salaries are $160,000 a year. Uh, that's not an incredible number, but what you have to look at is everything that goes along with a bishop. You have a uh, Episcopal residence, uh, uh, essentially an executive home uh, for these bishops to, to live in. Uh, now, not all conferences own an executive parsonage for their uh, bishop to live in, but I'll give you an example. The North Carolina Conference uh, has a, a nearly million dollar home in Raleigh, North Carolina that had been the Episcopal residence of the uh, North Carolina Conference Bishop for many years. It's on the market right now for sale, a little over $900,000 if you're looking for a home in Raleigh. Uh, but uh, that's a good move on their part to, to lessen that debt. But they're still going to offer a housing allowance to the bishop um, that will allow the bishop to pretty much continue that standard of living in an executive home, in an executive neighborhood, with their $160,000 salary, uh, their church car, their church driver, their staffs, which are, are in some cases enormous. Uh, because the, the United Methodist Church over the years has uh, built uh, a bureaucracy for themselves that is self-promoting and self-justifying. What I mean by that is uh, the need to have a bishop is not to really take care of a local church. It's to take care of this big bureaucracy. That's all they're there for. Uh, a local church may never have any interaction whatsoever with a bishop. Absolutely none. Other than the possibility of having a new pastor assigned. That's it. But they're not going to hear from the bishop. They're going to hear from the district superintendent. Another layer of bureaucracy uh, that is unneeded uh, in the Methodist Church. Uh, so all of these uh, bureaucratic entities are going to be left with the United Methodist Church after May. Um, how they're going to tackle that, uh, I don't think anyone knows. Uh, I would assume they've given it some thought. Uh, the, the finance folks uh, have published a, a few things that seem to point in the direction that they're trying to figure all this out. Uh, certainly, they're probably going to try and ask traditionalists to chip in and pay for some of that, but I see absolutely no reason to do so. Uh, it's time for a clean split. Uh, let progressives go off and do their thing, and let traditionalists go off and do their own thing. Uh, it's going to be a, a difficult separation. I don't see it being easy, um, but, but it is necessary absolutely necessary. You know, I was doing some research the other day on uh, some of the things that the United Methodist Church believes in, and one of the things that really surprised me was uh, the church's position on abortion. Uh, the United Methodist Church is in favor of a woman's choice, a right to choose uh, what she does with her unborn child. Um, from where I sit as a traditionalist, that's absolutely incompatible with Christianity. Uh, killing an unborn child, uh, can't, uh, you just can't reconcile that. I don't know how you do that. How do you, you, you bring all that together and say that is fine? Uh, I've had many uh, friends, I guess I would call them friends, who unfriended me on Facebook over the abortion issue. And here's why they unfriended me. Uh, when I showed them a picture of what a 22 week old baby looked like, it absolutely obliterated uh, this image that many uh, liberal and pro-choice folks 
have in their head that uh, it's just a blob of tissue. Uh, it's a fetus. They like to call it a fetus. Uh, but seeing that 22-week-old baby that is perfectly formed, uh, has all of its digits, has uh, all of its factors, and, and can, in many cases, survive outside the womb. It obliterates them. It absolutely obliterates them, and they unfriend me. And, and I'm fine with that. Uh, but I did get to inoculate them. That picture of that 22-week-old baby inoculated them. The image that they carried in their head that uh, it was a blob of tissue that was being uh, ripped apart in an abortion uh, is gone. They know that it's a baby. It's a baby that is being dismembered through the process of abortion. Each limb is ripped off, the head is ripped off, the baby is completely dismantled so they can get it out of the womb. Uh, that is a horrible thing to think about. Absolutely horrible. And, and I didn't want to get off on a, a tangent there, but I do want to illustrate that there are many things that uh, progressives in the United Methodist Church uh, believe in and support uh, that I think a lot of traditionalists uh, simply don't support and, and many of us can't live with. So this separation, again, is necessary, it's important, and, and it needs to be as clean as possible.